This video is dedicated to Jing Ouyang, who was kind enough to support this project to make more videos, and who um, was looking for a little bit of advice on how to practice the swan by Song Song. And so, you know, I've been thinking about how to pick apart the swan in, in your practice and how to work on it. And one of the things, of course, that sticks out of me as really needing some thought and consideration and careful practice is these uh, runs, ascending runs, um, and the shifts on top. So, for example, I'm talking about spots like here. Okay, that kind of moment. And there are, I guess, three similar ones or two other similar ones um, throughout the piece. Now, of course, just slow practice. Probably with no vibrato to start. is an excellent strategy. Um, of course, what you want in the end is some great direction leading to that top. Uh, and we'll talk about how to work on that in a minute. But before we get there, I think one of the most important things you need to consider for these couple of runs is how you're going to do your shift. Is it an old bow shift or is it a new bow shift? And what I mean by that is in coming up to it, do you move your bow first and then shift? Change directions of the bow and then shift? Or do you start shifting and then when your finger arrives, then you change the bow? Now, these are just two different ways of shifting. And, um, you know, I would say it doesn't matter so much which one you choose, but you need to be able to do both and you need to make a conscious decision about which one you're using. Some people would argue very strongly for one or the other. I think it's the one you like is the one you should do. And I'll play them a little faster so you can hear what this would sound like um, in context a little more. So this is the, the new bow shift. I'm going to change my direction and then shift. So it'll sound like... Okay, and here is the other version, the old bow shift. preference, go with that one, but make sure to practice them both so you can do them both. And I would take it slow to start, like super slow, change bow, shift, or the opposite, shift, change bow, because it's a little bit of a coordination weird thing. Um, and this would apply to the other runs as well. Now with the second run, the one in measure eight, there's another little thing um, that I like to think about with this particular shift. Since it's a little bit higher, there's a type of shift that I find works really well here. And it might be partially because I have kind of small hands. Um, if you have huge hands, you might not find this necessary. But what I like to do... Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring my thumb up and then open my hand. Okay, so I'll show you that one more time. I brought my thumb up and then shifted, leaving my thumb where it is. Now, the alternative to this is just to shift everything up together. And again, there's not one true way. I just personally like the stability of leaving my thumb and opening my hand. Um, so, I'll show you that. One more time. Okay. So that type of shift is worth considering at that moment because um, it just makes you feel secure and stable. But regardless of how you do it, either this way or this way, shift back and forth a bunch of times just isolating it would be an excellent thing to practice. Once you're great at the shifts, I would say the other really big challenge of this piece from my perspective is the long phrases and keeping a, um, a consistent long line without losing your intensity during these long notes. And one way that I really like to practice it is by subdividing um, the rhythm. And you could do it with eighth notes, but I personally, in this case, I think I'm going to do sixteenths. 
So just plain old subdivision would be, you know, there's four sixteenth notes in the first note, four sixteenth notes in the second, so I would go one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Okay, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Just putting the number of sixteenth notes inside the note that would fit with that rhythm. But that's just for working on the rhythm. Now, to actually work on the phrasing, what you need to do is make that really musical. And it's much easier to, to um, have your ideal phrases come through with all these separate bows than it is with these super long um, legato sustained bows. So let me show you what I'm talking about. We've got... you to join me. If you haven't already, play it with me. Let's do the whole thing with that type of subdivided 16th note. Okay, and if your phrasing is a little different than mine, that's cool. Just make sure that you're giving it some shape and direction. Here we go. And. some musical ideas. Now, what's hard is taking that and translating it into the bow distribution that you will need in real life for the, um, those phrasing ideas to come through. So as a next step, what I'd suggest is do the same 16th notes, but with the actual bowing. So I'm talking about up bow and down bow staccato here. Would maybe look like this. Um, but you get the idea. So you'd go through the whole thing and it will really help you understand how you're going to need to um, divide up your bow and arrange your bow distribution to make your phrases come through. Um, I learned that I did, should have started a little further out in the bow to begin with. Um, anyhow, that would be the next step and then going for just the legato version. 